Hello friends, I've just taken a break from uh, catching them all, as it were. Just kidding, I don't really know anything about Pokemon other than I have this t-shirt and my son's been drawing one Pokemon per day uh, to keep himself entertained, so go Nate. Uh, in any case, today we're moving on to carbohydrates. So we're going to spend today talking about carbohydrate structure and chemistry, and the next time we're going to move on to carbohydrate metabolism. We will talk about the reactions of the glycolysis pathway and the reactions of the citric acid pathway and draw connections from what you've seen before in OCHEM to important uh, biochemical reactions. So here we go <coughs> with notability. Um, there are a few things to know about sugars. I'm going to draw glucose in its six-membered ring form. So here is the chair form of glucose. Uh, and I'm going to draw the OH groups here. Uh, this is a six carbon sugar, which many of you have seen before. Uh, and a couple of interesting features. First, carbon one, you should recognize that functional group as a hemiacetal. Um, second, note that in glucose you uh, have this all equatorial arrangement of OH groups at carbons 2, 3, and 4, sort of this pattern of down, up, down. Um, and then finally on carbon 5 uh, you're also equatorial up. We call this molecule as drawn here beta D glucopyranose. All right that's a lot to take in so let's uh, digest um, each portion of the name individually. Uh, the beta refers to stereochemistry at stereochemical configuration at the hemiacetal carbon. And uh, actually, we're, we're going to introduce another term for the hemiacetal carbon, which we're going to use in glucose uh, and, and in other carbohydrates. Um, the hemiacetal carbon will be called the anomeric carbon. And um, this configuration will be beta if OH is up and alpha if OH is down, but only on C1, the anomeric carbon. Okay. Uh, second, and da -da. maybe we'll move things down so we've got plenty of room. Second, D. Oh dear. D refers to stereochemical configuration at carbon 6. Rather, sorry, that's incorrect. 
B refers to stereochemical configuration at carbon five. Um, and the configuration at carbon five is D if the hydroxy methyl group is up um, in this arrangement of glucose, or uh, I suppose, in other words, we might say uh, if the configuration is R at that stereo center, and then L if the hydroxy methyl group is down from this perspective or has an S configuration. Uh, D and L are sort of old-timey uh, stereochemical configuration terms, uh, but we continue to use them for glucose and molecules that are related to or derived from glucose. <clears throat> okay, so beta refers to stereochemical configuration at carbon-1. D refers to stereochemical configuration at carbon-5. Um, the next portion, gluco, refers to stereochemical configuration at carbons 2, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon and carbon 4. Um, it is... Hmm, I give myself some space. If we draw the molecule in this way, um, we're going to use the term gluco if it's down, up, down from this perspective. We're going to use the term uh, mano if it's up, up, down, and we'll use, and I guess I gotta move some stuff, sorry, running out of space just a little bit, and it will be galacto if it's down, up, up, and uh, we could be more uh, specific here. Um, in terms of doing R and S stereochemical configuration. Uh, but if you draw the glucose molecule in this way from this perspective, then these uh, descriptions will work. Another thing is that um, OHs are all equatorial in glucose. Um, in mannose, uh, the C2OH group is axial up, and in galactose, the C4OH group is axial up. There is a stereoisomer where the C3 uh, hydroxyl Um, is axial down, uh, uh, and that molecule is called galactose. I'm sorry, allose, but we won't worry about that in this class. Glucose, mannose, and galactose are honestly the ones that you're going to see the most of. Okay, so we've gotten a little bit more detail there about the name. Pyran refers to the fact that um, in this molecule, hmm, I don't really like my arrow. Pyran refers to a six membered ring with one of the atoms being oxygen. And I guess we should be specific. One of the atoms actually in the ring 
uh, is oxygen. And then the OS tells you that the molecule is a carbohydrate or is derived from a carbohydrate. And carbohydrates are molecules that have the general formula CNH2ON. That's why they're called carbohydrates. So as an example for glucose, the equation is C6H12O6. Uh, and I guess that's the uh, formula for glucose, mannose, and uh, galactose. All right. So we've dealt a little bit with the naming of the sugars. Um, so let me give you some examples of other sugars and we'll name them. If we put the C4OH axial up, this is beta D galactopyranose. Uh, and if we put the C2OH group up at an axial position, hmm, gonna have to take a minute to redraw that. This would be beta D manopyranos. All right, now that we can see the five pieces of information that are contained in each sugar name, uh, we can start to think about uh, the stereochemical relationship between uh, each of these sugars. So beta D glucopyranose and beta D galactopyranose and beta D manopyranose are related to each other stereochemically. What term would we use to describe the stereochemical relationship between these three compounds. Okay, are you thinking? You can pause the video and think about it. Okay, if you said diastereomers, you are right. They are diastereomers of each other. Now let's talk about why they're diastereomers of each other. Notice that the only difference in stereochemical configuration between beta-D-galactopyranose and beta-D-glucopyranose is the configuration of carbon-4 here. Similarly, the only difference between beta-D-manopyranose and beta-D-glucopyranose is the configuration of carbon-2 here. So they, these uh, are not enantiomers. They're clearly not mirror images of each other. If they were enantiomers, they would have opposite stereochemistry at each and every carbon. Uh, here, they have the same stereochemistry at all but one. Uh, diastereomers that, let's see, I guess I'll choose, continue to choose gray. Diastereomers that differ in configuration at only one stereo center are also called, new word here, and we'll use a 
darker font, epimers. Okay, diastereomers that differ in configuration at one, but not all stereo centers. We're going to call those epimers. So we might say that Matt, that galactopyranose is a beta D galactopyranose is the C4 epimer of glucose, and we might say that beta D manopyranose is the C2 epimer of glucose. Um, finally, even though we've talked about the meanings behind all of these names, we're going to use uh, shorthand. Uh, we might call this molecule beta D glucose, though that technically refers to the open chain form rather than the cyclic hemiacetal form. We'll also use beta D galactose for um, the uh, instead of, as shorthand for beta D galactopyranose, and we'll use beta D mannose as shorthand for beta D manopyranose. All right. So a few things there. Um, let's begin uh, our discussion of carbohydrate chemistry, uh, talking about the stereochemical configuration of that um, C1, the anomeric carbon. So I'm going to write, rewrite the structure of glucose. And we'll call this chemistry of the anomeric carbon. So first, here is beta D glucopyranose. And this is the cyclic hemiacetal form. of the following molecule. And uh, having gotten to the open chain form, it is possible to close up back to the, but to close up with different stereochemical configurations such that the C1 hydroxyl group would be down instead of up, okay? So this would be beta D glucopyranose And then here we would just have regular beta D glucose, open chain form. And then here we would have alpha D glucopyranose. Um, so you could say that alpha-D-glucopyranose is the C1 epimer of beta-D-glucopyranose. The relationship between the two molecules are diastereomers. Um, and we have a special word for carbohydrates that are diastereomers of each other that differ only in the configuration of the, uh, of the anomeric carbon, we will call them anomers. So, alpha and beta D glucopyranose are C1 epimers of each other, that is diastereomers 
that differ in configuration only at the anomeric carbon. All right. Um, how might this mechanism for opening of the cyclic hemiacetal happen? Um, I'm going to copy our structure of glucose. Um, it is possible that a base of some sort could remove a proton from the C1 hydroxyl group, and then these electrons could kick down to form a new carbon-oxygen pi bond, and these electrons would leave to be on the, a negatively charged oxygen, which would subsequently pick up a proton Um, probably from the conjugate base of our acid, like this. And that would get us to the open chain form of glucose. And then we could use a similar mechanism to form the hemiacetal again, uh, but get the alpha anomer. Another option we could consider um, for this process of converting one beta anomer into another would be sorry, would be to first protonate the OH group, the oxygen of the ring with some acid. And this should be old hat by this point. You know how to draw cyclic hemiacetals uh, forming. You know how to draw them coming apart. It's interesting to show that in the context of the glucose molecule, but this should be pretty much review for you at this point. Uh, then electrons on the oxygen could kick down and kick off the OH group, and that would give you this oxonium ion which could be deprotonated probably by the conjugate base of our acid. Um, to give us the open chain form. And then we could go backwards and reform the uh, hemiacetal, uh, cyclic hemiacetal only uh, have it form with the OH group on C1 pointing down, and that would be that would form the uh, the alpha anomer. So this would be a base catalyzed opening, and then if you do the closing uh, in reverse, you could get the other anomer. Uh, below that, we would have. acid catalyzed opening and then a third and perhaps more direct op option is to go through an interesting intermediate uh, Uh, we would first protonate the OH group using some acid catalyst that would turn the OH group into 
a good leaving group. Whereupon the oxygen in the ring could kick off that leaving group. to give you this oxonium ion. Hmm, I don't like that bond that I just drew. Um, we can call this an oxonium ion in the uh, Michaelis group, they call this an oxocarbenium species. Um, but now that you've had the OH group leave and you have this resonance stabilized carbocationic intermediate, where the positive charge can either be on the oxygen or on the anomeric carbon, then you can have the water that left come back in and attack from the bottom face. Hmm, got to slide things over a little bit. No, didn't like that. Uh, and then that would give you the protonated form of the alpha anomer with a positive charge, oops, sorry folks, a positive charge on this carbon and then a base, probably the conjugate base of our acid would remove that proton and that would give you as a product, the, oops, that's not what we wanted. Sorry, folks. The alpha anomer of glucose. Okay. So either of these options, the uh, SN1-like option or opening up and closing back up are possibilities for converting the alpha anomer into the beta anomer. The idea I want you to have is that whether you go through an open chain intermediate or whether you alternatively go through uh, whether alternatively you go through the oxocarbenium intermediate. Um, the alpha and beta anomers are in equilibrium with each other. And the process of changing the configuration of the stereochemical configuration of the anomeric carbon is called muta rotation. Uh, because it looks like you've sort of rotated things around there. Uh, but you've had to break bonds to do it. All right, now that we've decided or, or demonstrated that the alpha and the beta anomers of glucose are in equilibrium with each other, let's talk about what the equilibrium constant for this equilibrium is. So I'm just going to copy the alpha structure and the beta structure here. 
except we're going to erase some things. Do, do, do. Sorry, nose is running a little bit. Don't mean to be gross. <clears throat> All right. So we'll call this anomeric equilibrium. And let's talk about which of the two anomers, the beta anomer or the alpha anomer, you would predict to be more stable? What are the differences you see between these two anomers? Think about it for a second. And if you notice the oxygen, let's see what color we used for the anomeric carbon, sure. Um, the oxygen in the beta anomer is equatorial, the OH is equatorial, whereas in the alpha anomer, the OH is axial. And we learned in 351 that there is a difference between having, some, having a group axial versus equatorial on a six-membered ring. And in fact, uh, there are for each, uh, for, for many different kinds of functional groups that might be attached to six-membered six rings, there are these numbers called A values that describe the um, difference in free energy between having a particular functional group axial versus equatorial. So the A value for... Um, the OH group is about 1.4 kcal per mole, or rather, I'm sorry, it's about 1 kcal per mole. And if you, and that means that there is a difference in free energy between having something alpha versus beta, Alpha is 1 kcal per mole less stable than beta. And if you do uh, the math, uh, equilibrium constant equals the uh, number E raised to the minus delta G over RT. Uh, if you do that math, uh, you come to the conclusion that you would expect an equilibrium mixture to have about 75% beta and 25% alpha. But in practice, we actually observe a much larger amount of alpha relative to beta. That is, we observe um, Uh, the one-to-one -one mixture of alpha and beta anomers, meaning the equilibrium constant is close to one and the difference in free energy between the two of them is close to zero. Uh, in other words, the alpha anomer appears to be more stable than we expect based only on sterics. All right, well, what's going on? The, uh, <clears throat> the observation that the alpha anomer is more stable than you would expect based only on sterics is an observation that is called, huh, we can use a different color there since we're using pink for the anomeric carbon. color things in. Sorry, egregious waste of lecture time on coloring. This is an effect we call 
the anomeric effect. Surprising, huh? And um, now let's talk about the origins of that anomeric effect. Why is the alpha anomer more stable than we would expect? Okay. Um, so let's zoom in on that alpha anomer and let's consider some of the orbitals that might be in play that might help us understand why the alpha anomer could be more stable than the beta anomer. So if we look at this carbon hydrogen, a uh, carbon oxygen bond on carbon one, what, let's draw what the uh, empty sigma star for the carbon oxygen bond looks like. Um, so this is a sigma star antibonding orbital. There would be a node in between the two nuclei. Uh, there would be a small lobe here on this side of oxygen, a larger lobe here on the other side, a small lobe here, and then a larger lobe here on the other side of carbon. And we can fill in the phase relationships if we want to. Looks like we need to use slightly different font. Okay, so you have this empty carbon oxygen sigma star, <coughs> but on the adjacent atom, you have lone pair electrons on the oxygen. Um, and we can draw those lone pair electrons as though they were in an sp3 type orbital, though this is an oversimplification. Uh, in fact, the, uh, they're in an orbital that's much more like just a regular p orbital, but we'll uh, not necessarily worry about that for now. You've got lone pair electrons on the oxygen in the ring. And this is a filled uh, non bonding, non bonded atomic orbital. And we would just call it N. I guess I'd like the font to be black. And so we can get donation of electrons. Oh, whoops. I just decided that I wanted to be using gray. Sorry about that, folks. We can get donation of electron density into the empty sigma star of the carbon oxygen bond. Uh, we will call this N to sigma star hyperconjugation. This is spreading out of lone pair electrons. from the oxygen atom into the empty carbon oxygen sigma star on C1. Um, and hyperconjugation is stabilizing because the non-bonding lone pair electrons spread out, which means they experience more nuclei and they are lower in energy. Uh, and second, the uh, antibonding orbital spreads out a little bit as well, uh, though we don't need to necessarily worry about that at this point. Um, Uh, 
Okay, so this is a stabilizing interaction. And when you have that OH at this axial down position, um, the sigma star lines up nicely with the non-bonding lone pair electrons on oxygen. Uh, in contrast, let's see what we would expect for the beta anomer. Um, again, we've got non-bonding lone pair electrons on the oxygen of the ring. Oops get my shading in order. But when the OH group at C1 is equatorial, the sigma star is not very well lined up with the non-bonding lone pair electrons on the adjacent atom. Uh, in fact, the non-bonding lone pair electrons on the adjacent atom are more or less perpendicular to those lone pair electrons. Okay. Um, so again, here is the empty carbon oxygen sigma star. Here is the filled orbital of non-bond, orbital, non-bonding orbital filled with um, lone pair electrons. Um, the non-bonding lone pair appears to be more or less perpendicular or orthogonal to the sigma star. So there can't be uh, uh, very strong hyperconjugation, much weaker hyperconjugation, less stabilization. Now, uh, if you took 351, you might remember that hyperconjugation is usually an effect that's worth around 1 kcal per mole. And if you go back to the difference in free energy we expected up here based on sterics, it's about a kcal per mole. So based on sterics, you'd expect the beta anomer to be more stable than the alpha by about a kcal per mole. Based on hyperconjugation, you'd expect the alpha anomer to be more stable by about a kcal per mole. Those two effects offset each other, and in the end, we get the 50-50 mixture. Um, now, depending on um, the strength of the bond between carbon and whatever group is uh, on carbon one, uh, the anomeric effect can be worth a lot more. That is, um, if a sigma star is per on carbon one is particularly low in energy, the anomeric effect can actually bias the equilibrium even more heavily in direction of the alpha anomer. Um, for example, we will see, or you might see later on, if you go on in, in chemistry, that uh, if we put a halide at this C1 position, the anomeric effect gets much stronger uh, because the hyperconjugation is more important when the sigma star is lower in energy, and that's true for bonds that are less stable than carbon-oxygen bonds. All right. So that is the anomeric effect. And it's explained because of hyperconjugation. Now, um,
there's a lot of carbohydrate chemistry that we could talk about, and your text takes you through uh, some of it. Um, I'd like you to take a look at glycoside formation. Uh, I don't want to spend time talking about it here, but if you look at your text, the formation of glycosides is described in section 27.7. Uh, I want you to take a look at glycoside formation and hydrolysis. Um, basically, if we take glucose uh, and some, oh, I forgot, sorry, can you hold that thought? Uh, sometimes we will describe if we have a mixture of alpha and beta anomers um, will draw the molecule this way. This is important, so I'm sorry to backtrack, but it's useful. You will see chemists draw uh, the following structure when they mean to communicate that you have some uncharacterized mixture of alpha and beta anomers. They'll simply put a squiggly line here at anomeric carbon number one. Okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to use that now because I'm going to draw a mixture of alpha mixture of alpha and beta anomers of glucose and uh, demonstrate that if you supply an excess of alcohol along with acid, uh, you don't need a lot of acid, you just need a catalytic amount of acid, you can convert the free sugar into which used to be a hemiacetal you can con, you can uh, convert it into a complete acetal which uh, when you make an acetal with the anomeric carbon the resulting functional group is called a glycoside. So we would say this is the methyl glycoside of glucose. Um, the mechanism is easy. Uh, it involves, it looks a lot like the mutarotation mechanism. You protonate the OH group on C1. Electrons on the neighboring oxygen kick down and kick off water as a leaving group and then alcohol can attack the resulting uh, resonance stabilized oxonium or oxocarbenium ion, uh, either from above or below, and uh, then uh, deprotonation of the positively charged oxygen uh, results in the methyl glycoside. Um, it would also be useful to, for you to know the mechanism of glycoside hydrolysis. That would just be the backwards reaction uh, and would involve, looks like we're running out of battery, so we may have to cut this short, the backwards reaction to get from the glycoside back to the hemiacetal would just be to use hydronium in an excess of water. That's basically acetal hydrolysis conditions. Um, so that may be useful uh, to know, and I want you to take a look at that mechanism because it's uh, typical of a lot of mechanisms involving carbohydrate chemistry. Um, for the last little bit, I want to show you some interesting glycosides. 
Um, and the question that we could ask is, uh, sorry, we'll call this section glycosides. The question we could ask is, what if the OH, or rather, sorry, what if the alcohol in glycoside formation is another sugar? So let me give you some examples of glycosides where we link two sugars together. Um, as an example, we'll start simply by linking two glucose units together. Uh, glycosides where, uh, where the alcohol that makes the glycoside is actually on another sugar are called saccharides and uh, a saccharide with two units is uh, called a disaccharide. You could probably have figured that out. I don't know why I'm writing it out here. Okay, so Let's draw you a disaccharide that is called maltose. And uh, you can isolate this uh, from, uh, it's a sugar found in malt, which you can get uh, from germinated grains like barley. Um, it involves two glucose molecules linked together <clears throat> here is anomeric carbon C1 on the first glucose and this first glucose has the alpha configuration and then the one the the, the oxygen from the second sugar that forms that acetal or that glycoside is C4 of the second sugar. Okay, so this is maltose. A couple of things when talking about uh, disaccharides, uh, we're going to name Sometimes these disaccharides have um, non-systematic names like maltose, um, but we will often name these with information about the stereochemistry and the connectivity of the glycosidic linkage. Um, so the, the glycoside or the acetal, where we will often talk about in terms of biochemists will call this the glycosidic linkage. And they will describe the glycosidic linkage by telling you what the configuration of the anomeric carbon is. So uh, here, the anomeric carbon one that's involved in the glycoside is alpha. So this will be an alpha, then in parentheses, one to four glycosidic linkage. And uh, this describes the shape of that connection. Uh, another feature of uh, disaccharides is that many of them have directionality. Um, the end that has the free hemiacetal end is called 
the reducing end. And it's called the reducing end because um, it has basically characteristics of an aldehyde functional group and under certain reactive conditions can be oxidized. And um, disaccharides with a free hemiacetal end are called reducing sugars. So maltose is an example of a reducing sugar. All right, let's see, a couple more disaccharides to consider. One that is quite common and that we may have talked about before is lactose. Uh, this is the principal disaccharide found in human and cow milk. Uh, it's not particularly sweet. Um, a, a lot of saccharides taste sweet, but the impact or, or the extent of sweetness varies widely from saccharide to saccharide. Um, lactose consists of, oh, I'm sorry, let's back off just a little bit. You've got the hemiacetal end or the reducing end, and then the other end where the anomeric carbon is tied up in an acetal, we're just going to call the non-reducing end. Okay, uh, and many sugars have this sort of directionality from a non-reducing end to a reducing end. Not all, and, and we'll show you an example of a, a sugar that doesn't have a reducing, a saccharide that doesn't have a reducing end in just a little bit. Um, lactose is the connection of galactose the C4 epimer of glucose. Um, to a molecule of glucose. As with maltose, it's a 1,4 linkage between the anomeric carbon of galactose, C1 of galactose, and an OH group on C4 of glucose. I need to redraw my chair. <coughs> so um, this part of the sugar we would call galactose. This part of the sugar we would call glucose. We would call the glycosidic linkage here. Uh, this is the acetal or the glycoside. And we would characterize the glycosidic linkage as being uh, because the configuration of the anomeric carbon is beta. The oxygen on the anomeric carbon is up equatorial, we'll, uh, at least we'll call that beta configuration. This is a beta 1, 4 glycosidic linkage. Now you may be wondering wh why it is that only one of the sugars, uh, one of the OH groups on glucose ends up bonded to the anomeric carbon of galactose. Great question. Uh, if you're making this molecule in the lab rather than isolating it from milk, uh, you would have to do quite a bit of uh, protecting group chemistry to get to make it so that the uh, OH on carbon four of glucose was unique and different from the uh, OH from any of the other OHs in the molecule. That being said, these saccharides from biological sources have enzymes that catalyze the reactions and that govern the regio uh, selectivity. Um, and I believe when we talked about acetals earlier this semester, um, we mentioned that uh, infants 
uh, express an enzyme that can hydrolyze this beta-1,4 glycosidic linkage between galactose and glucose. But the expression of that enzyme goes down in adults, and uh, that is why many adults are lactose intolerant. If you don't hydrolyze this sugar in your stomach and small intestine, it passes through to the colon and begins to be digested by bacteria there uh, who uh, grow and you can have bloating and gas and other gastrointestinal symptoms. Um, in people of uh, sort of northern European descent, uh, there was a mutation many thousands of years ago that enabled the expression of this, uh, the enzyme that hydrolyzes galactose to uh, be upregulated. And that is why many people of European descent are not uh, lactose intolerant. Uh, it's thought that this mutation generated a selective advantage for people in the European area who were able to then gain nutrition from dairy products. Cows had been domesticated about this time. Uh, gaining nutrition from milk and cheese, which might have uh, taken some of the risk of boom-bust crop cycles out of daily human existence. All right, uh, but there's a lot more uh, to talk about there, but we need to, I think, mention maybe just one more sugar before we're done. See how we're doing on time. Okay, I think we're already kind of done with this lecture. Let me just show you uh, the last sugar, the last structure uh, of a sugar that's quite common and that you've encountered, and that is sucrose. When people say sugar or table sugar, this is usually what they mean. Uh, sucrose is a disaccharide between glucose and fructose. Um, fructose is actually an isomer of glucose. Fructose is a five-membered ring sugar uh, with oxygen in the ring, and so uh, fructose is what we will call a furanose, a five-membered ring sugar. And I'm not going to ask you to memorize uh, structures of sugars. Um, Memorization questions are silly on open note exams anyway. Um, but with something that's <laughs> so important to uh, modern living, uh, it would be useful for you to at least have seen the structure of sucrose. Let's see. Um, so the glucose is alpha uh, configured. Um, and then the fructose is a five membered ring containing sugar, where we'll put the oxygen here. Oh no, that's not how we wanted to do it. Whoops, let's try that again. Um, So you'll notice um, on fructose, the uh, acetal carbon is carbon two. We're gonna talk about fructose a little bit later uh, next time, but for now you can just look at the structure. This portion is glucose, this portion is fructose. Um, In the uh, sorry, I'm trying to think of how to describe this. Uh, in sucrose, the anomeric carbon of glucose is involved uh, in a glycoside, uh, and the anomeric carbon of galact uh, I'm sorry, of fructose is involved in the same uh, glycoside. So anomeric 
carbons on both carbohydrates or sugars are connected via glycosidic linkage, um, we won't worry about calling this beta 1 to 4. Um, I suppose you could call this alpha 1 to 2, but I'm not sure how you would describe uh, what the stereochemistry at the C2 of the fructose is. In any case, because the anomeric uh, carbons of both sugars are tied together via a glycoside or an acetal, we're going to call this a non-reducing sugar because there are no free hemiacetal groups. So this sugar, the two reduce, the reducing ends of either of these two disaccharides are pulled together. Um, and it turns out that, well, we'll have more to say about fructose and glucose later. But I think this concludes what I want to tell you about carbohydrate structure. There's so much more we could talk about, but we're going to move next time on to metabolism of these sugars. That is, how do cells take, uh, what is the chemistry, what are the mechanisms behind converting glucose uh, all the way down to CO2 and water? How do we do that? There's two processes. One's called glycolysis and the other is called the citric acid cycle. We'll talk about both of them in detail. Uh, until next time, Stay safe, stay healthy, and my uh, sign-off line is stay organic. <laughs>